Rangers fans, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chelney, alongside Nick Zararis. And Nick, we have Molly Walker of the New York Post coming on in just a few minutes. But before she comes on, trade deadline was this past Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. The Rangers were rumored in everybody, including the kitchen sink. They ultimately got Jack Roslovic. They got Alex Wenberg. They got Chad Ruedel as well to fill out that blue line. A lot of, a lot of rumors, but only the Rangers didn't trade pro. They didn't trade, you know, Brennan Othman or insert other prospects here. They got who they got, and this is the team that, Chris Drury feels is going to win the Stanley Cup. Your overall thoughts from these past few days, Nick. All right. So I'm going to give you my conspiracy first, and then we'll get to the mainstream. Number Uh one, I think the Rangers were really good about getting their message out about how they felt about the market because five different people from five different publications all said the exact same thing. Jury didn't overpay. He didn't give away anything expensive and they still got useful pieces, which I agree with. I I do agree. I like the ideas of the players. You know, we talked about Roslovic at the end of January as somebody who could be a change of scenery upside guy. Wenberg, you know, not the flashiest, but I think he's an upgrade from Brodzinski. Whether or not Brodzinski draws in over Goudreau, that'll be a conversation I'm sure a lot of people will have over the final 17 games of the regular season. I don't think there's a world where they're going to take Goudreau out of the lineup, so I don't find arguing about it to be particularly fruitful. I do think they were serious about Gensel. Uh, everything I have heard leads me to believe they were pretty serious about trying to make that happen, but it didn't materialize. Whether you want to believe the the Rangers weren't going to beat the Carolina offer because Kyle Dubas really wanted Michael Bunting, whether you believe it's the Rangers weren't ready to meet the price, whatever it is, I do think they were serious about that. And if they had pulled that trade off, everybody would have been really excited. Gensel, you know, two-time 40-goal guy, really good hockey player. But the cost would have been significant, and that would have given people ammo to use against the general manager. I'm not saying the general manager did not trade for the star player because he was looking out for his own neck. I'm saying it is something you should consider in your evaluation of all of this because there are eight different versions of every story when it comes to the trade deadline. Everybody talks, and as we Molly mentioned on what we recorded with her, jury plays everything very close to the vest. The Rangers don't leak that much like they used to. You know, you used to know the Rangers moves a month ahead of time. You, when it, when Jeff Gordon or, or Glenn Sather was running the show, they would be in Larry's column a month before the, the move was going to come. The players they were interested in, what it was going to cost. The Rangers are pretty good about not leaking anymore. So you got to think about who was saying this stuff earlier in the week last week. You know, it was Emily Kaplan who does occasionally get things, but a lot of this stuff I think is mention Rangers engagement, mention Rangers engagement. By the way, and this is, I guess, for engagement, but uh, I have not created a, a, a doppelganger of myself. I know it says my name under you, under uh, where it should say, oh, yeah. uh, under where it should say your name. But uh, you know, I, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you've gotten a name change, Nick. I don't know. That's maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we should. That's technology, which will be a recurring sh- theme if you're watching this after the fact with our <laughs> recording with Molly, where technical difficulties did arise. We didn't get to ask if it was Spectrum or FiOS's fault. Under mm. oversight on our part. Ah, uh, well, go ahead, yeah. Andrew. That, well, that's you see, that's that's when brains get involved and they'll be mad at us and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I mean the the thing about the first line right winger, and I and we I asked Molly this in the in the beginning of our conversation. They didn't get Gensel. They didn't get Butchnevich. Now, was Butchnevich ever even no. remotely going to be moved, or was it because of clickbait and, and farming engagements, all these types of things? We'll never know the answer to these because the insiders will never let us know. But I think there's, I think there's more than one correct answer to this, where the Rangers didn't get their first line right winger. And that in and of itself is not ideal. It's the Rangers would be better right now with Jake Ensel than with whoever, you know, whoever they ultimately stick on that first line right winger spot. Now, if that was even a remote possibility without trading Perot, Othman, 17 first round picks and all these things, I don't know the answer to that. I, what we do know is that Drury was talking to Dubis you know, pretty considerably about yeah, he Gensel. Got Chad so, R- yeah, he got he got Chad Ruweedle Ru- as a consolation prize. Uh, and by the way, Chad Ruweedle is is good. 
Like he, he, he in, in sheltered bottom six minutes, he provides exactly what you need him to do. So he's, he's a, he's a positive addition to the blue line when he needs to play. I, I also think, you know, the, the argument that because they didn't get one of those top guys. Yeah. Roslovic is good. Roslovic is a good player. He's going to make the Rangers better. Alex Wenberg is a player that is going to make the Rangers better, but the Rangers also knew that they had that first line right winger spot open the entire season. They tried Jimmy Vesey there. They they tried Blake Wheeler there. I joke we joked about it with Molly a few minutes ago. They tried me. They tried you. They've tried Molly. They've tried everybody at that first line right winger spot. Tried Larry. Uh, maybe maybe they should have tried Larry. May, yeah, and and maybe uh you know he'll loosen up on Krapsoff because he keeps bringing them him up in in his in his uh, columns. But uh we you know I joke obviously, but like. They didn't necessarily fill that hole yet because there's still a debate of who is going to be the first line right winger. And that should tell you how the like, how the Rangers approach this deadline and what they and how they feel about it because they knew that this was their biggest hole. Yes, they uh, obviously with with Heedle out for the season, that was going to be a hole and they addressed that hole pretty well. They also knew that that top line spot had a problem. And the fact that after the deadline, the storyline or the understanding is they still don't know who is going to fit there. That I feel like is still an issue. Okay. So I don't necessarily disagree with you. I do think I see the vision with Roslovic. I understand exactly sure. what they see in him. They think that a change of scenery, and I touched about this briefly over the weekend, he's a career like 11% shooter. He's shooting like 7%. He's on a, he was on a god-awful hockey team, so it's hard to take a lot of his underlying results as like a direct, this is how he plays. But the reason I was encouraged about Roslovic and why I considered him in the first place was his transition stuff. That is something that 93 and 20 have really struggled with at times where if they can't get into the offensive zone cleanly with speed and with control of the puck, they'll dump it in and they won't go get it because neither of them are particularly adept four checkers. They're not great along the boards individually, which is frustrating because, you know, we, we all know Chris Kreider's jacked as all hell and would put any of us to shame with no shirt on, but he doesn't use it for whatever reason. He's not out leveraging people with his body. So having somebody who is fast in a straight line who's on the bigger side, who can carry the puck, will make more space for them. I don't know if Roslovic is going to have the Frankie Vitrano 12 goals in 15 games in him. I don't think he probably will, but he's better than what they had. He deepens the lineup and ultimately the big picture. And there is another point on this I want to get to in a few minutes, which we'll touch on. But the bigger picture, the thing Andrew and I have hammered for a month now, it ultimately comes down to the core of this team. When you win a Stanley Cup, it is because three or four of your te- best players on your team are over a point per game. Your goalie is at least 915 save and your special teams are killing it. You know, Wenberg and Roslovic are better than the players they had in those spots. This deepens the lineup. It gives them more versatility. You know, that we saw it at the end of the game the other day, well, not the end of the game, but at one point in the game the other day where they were rolling Wenberg, VZ, and Goudreau as more of a shutdown defense group. And you have more options. You have more versatility. This opens more paths. We talk a lot about contingencies. What do you do if something's not working? The Rangers' margin for error got a little bit bigger not huge but they have a little bit more room now because the drop off from your first line your second line your third line your fourth line it got smaller not that much smaller but they have a little more room their lineup is a little bit deeper and they have some options they can play around a little bit with the lineup they've got 17 games they still got to figure out what rempe is going to be and i know we'll touch on that at some point as well but they have options they have more paths that is ultimately good no home runs solid double yeah, and, and I, you know, I said this a minute ago. I, we said this on you know on Twitter when when, the, when these trades happened. Like the trades in and of themselves, okay. I think Drury did well. It he didn't trade the every, everything in the kitchen sink. He didn't trade the key to the city to get these guys. And these are guys that are going to make this team better. It's a deeper team. He didn't acquire somebody like Pat Maroon, who essentially at this stage of his career is is not doing a whole He's lot. Just vibes. Yeah, it, he he didn't get a vibes per sixty player. 
And that in and of itself is a big plus. The three players that Chris Drury traded for, he didn't trade seven first round picks to get. He didn't trade for, for somebody that cannot physically help the Rangers play better hockey on the ice when he is out there on the ice, right? Like these are guys that are fundamentally going to make the Rangers deeper and better at their core. So he did a good job in, in these three deals. The, the question that we have to ask ourselves is that we, you know, we talk about it uh, on Twitter. We we're going to talk about it with Molly in a few minutes from now. You don't get a lot of opportunities at the Stanley cup. You really don't. A lot of teams like they pretend that they do. And in hockey, I guess you have more of a chance because hockey is a stupid, silly luck based sport where some, you, you get a, a six week stretch where everything goes your way and then you just win. Sometimes that happens in hockey happens more, more than more in hockey than in, in any other sport in North America, but you don't get a lot of opportunities to really, truly go for it. And the, the question that we have to ask ourselves is yes, Othman is a fantastic prospect. Perot is a sensational prospect. Like there are, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, pieces in the cupboards for the Rangers right now. They still have their first round pick this year, whether or not that has anything to do with the, with the Vegas sphere or not is above my pay grade, let's say, but these are guys that the Rangers have, and these are assets the Rangers have, would they have been better off in going all in and going for the Stanley Cup here? Maybe they wait for next year. I don't know. But in the trades that Drury did do, I think he did well. Yeah, I agree with you. Two things I want to push back on and build off of. Number one, um, the key to winning the Stanley Cup is making the playoffs every single year. I, I think that's the foundational principle. You got to look at the recent history of the league. Colorado consistently in the playoffs over and over again. Vegas has been in the playoffs every single year, but one Tampa Bay made the playoffs pretty consistently for a decade. Washington, the blues, same thing. Pittsburgh, same thing. Chicago, LA. I can go on and on. I think it's not so much going all in it's having things line up for you. And this is the big talking point I saw a lot of people saying in regards to the team of two years ago versus last year. The teams that add the stars at the deadline don't typically do well. I think that's not the right takeaway. I think the right takeaway is the teams that all win the Stanley Cup, they don't need to add a star because they already have the team they need. You know, I, I went and did a small thread about this where you look at Tampa Bay where Point and Kucherov were both almost more, they were both over a point per game over both playoff runs. They won the Stanley Cup. Colorado had four guys over a point per game on their way to a Stanley Cup. Vegas had four guys over a point per game. Those teams didn't need to add a Jake Gensel because they already had, you know, a Jack Eichel, a Mark Stone, a Kucherov. And that's really been the Rangers conundrum here for the last couple of years. So Benajad, Kreider, Fox, Panarin, Shesterkin, that's a good group. But the bar of a Stanley Cup is great. If this group can be great, it's not impossible. It's just you got to find the way. And we talked about we've talked about this all season. The gap between great and good, it's not that big. But what can the Rangers do to bridge that? Well, it, listen, and we talked about this with with Molly here uh, a little bit earlier on the show, but a lot of this has to do with the people that are already here. Like we like we've been talking about it for for months now. We talked about it with Molly, and and you know, like it's just one of those situations where the 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 top guys that have been here are the guys that are the ones that need to step up here and deliver. Like Patrick Kane's not coming through those doors to 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 magically all of a sudden fix this team, like, you know, fix the offense or or score a hundred points in ten games, and you know, waltz waltz this and like these things like these things aren't happening it is up to the guys that are currently in the locker room yeah the additions are great and they're going to make this team better but the stars that are here the stars that are you know making the making the most money the ones that are touching the puck the most the ones that are being trusted by peter lavilla and the coaching staff to go out there and deliver offense these are the guys that need to step up for two months and bring the Stanley Cup to the Rangers. Like it's the Roslovic is great if you know, but he's not going to score 30 goals in 16 consecutive Rangers wins. And they just, you know, cruise their way to a, like that's That's not happening. You have to rely on, uh, on everybody involved, but the vast majority of the pressure is on the guys that have been here that have been in the conference finals with the Rangers that have been 
to that first round defeat against the, the Devils last year. It's up to these guys at the end of the day to show up and deliver. And as much as Russell Wick and, and Winberg and Rubido are going to help, the brunt of everything falls on the stars that are currently here. So the one last point on this before we move on, I, I just went and pulled it up. When the Rangers went to the conference final two years ago, they had two players who were over a point per game in that run. That was Benajad and Fox. Kreider had 16 and 20. Panarin had 16 and 20. Kopp had 14 and 20. Again, good. The bar is great. And for the Rangers to get to that next tier, I don't know if this current group is capable of doing that for you know a month and a half, the way they're currently constructed. The possibility is there. And that's why in particular, and I said this to you before we started recording, this group has significantly better energy around it than last year's team. Oh, yeah. For a variety of Easily. reasons. And we, we've talked a lot about how things haven't really come together. Let me lay this out for you. Number one, the first line has not been great at five on five since November. Their third line has featured an AHL center since December. They have lost two top nine forwards. They have one defensive pair that is above 50% in all the key metrics. Their starting goalie was under a 900 save percentage the second week of February, and they have the fourth best record in the entire league. At some point, Mika Zibinijad is going to wake up. At some point, Chris Kreider is going to wake up. I just want to stop talking about him. At some point it's going to happen. They're just sheer probabilities. And this is the argument why I think it does happen. Zabinijad, I want to say is 31. Zabinijad, he's 30 and he will be 31 by the end of April. He's 31. I don't think Mika Zabinijad at 31 is cooked. Okay. I just, I don't think he's washed. I don't think like, this is the end of his age. This is the start of his age related decline. He is shooting about two, 3% off of his career average. That's probably, you know, another two or three goals somewhere in there. I think he's been a little bit cold on the power play as well. There's probably another couple goals in there as well, but you get them going at the right time and you see it. We've seen Zabinijad have the ability to go nuclear hot for a week. You know, we all yeah. remember that first week of March in 2020 where he had 11 goals in like six games where he genuinely looked like one that of the five goal best. game. Yeah, he looked like one of the he's, five he's best players. Yeah. He looked like one of the 10 best players in the entire world. The capability of being a dominating force is in there. I think... And this is thing. This is not like this is not based in statistics or anything. This is my gut feeling. I genuinely feel that he has to erupt at some point. Otherwise, we can have the conversation about maybe he isn't the player we thought he was, or maybe this is just who he is now. I genuinely think there has to be one of those eruptions. You know, I forget what it was in the month of March, something ridiculous if point spread, where I want to say it's like 108 points and 105 games in the month of March for his entire career. He is capable of being a really special player. It's just a matter of it coming together. 132 points in 159 games, but that also includes games with the Senators. So he is capable of being great. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I feel like it's going to happen at some point. This is the most frustrating thing about the the, the Zibanejad discourse. And again, I just I just wish he he'll he'd start scoring at five on five. Well, we so can we, stop talking about it. We can just do move on. We can I talk mean, about well, Rempe well, if you no, want. Well, no, because like it's 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 one of the biggest storylines heading into the playoffs is that this man has gotten thirty games out scoring a five on five goal, and I wish he would score so that we could talk about him, you know, in a different in a different you know angle. But like the the most frustrating thing about Zibanejad is that he has all of the talent in the world, and we see it in situations where he like he doesn't necessarily need it like in the shootout the uh, the other day i forget i forget who they played but like that shootout goal where he just absolutely ripped a shot and it went in like his shot is incredible his like we all know his passing is great he can skate really fast when he but wants we diagnosed this when, andrew when, he, yeah, doesn't, like, he doesn't have the space and that's why roslovic right. is going to help hopefully in theory they did what they could based on the market around them to improve the lineup as currently constructed. Whether or not you believe the lineup is good enough, that's an entirely different conversation. Yeah. But as far as the team itself, the capability is there. One thing I would like to talk about, and we did touch on this later, but 
I want to see Rempe getting more than seven minutes a game. He got 11 on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I know that game was out of hand. I know the Blues were more or less dead. But if he's going to be on the playoff roster, he's got to play. We can't do, we can't play with 11 forwards. You know, I I know we all joke about the Stu Bickle seven minute triple overtime game. That was funny and all, but that was part of the reason those John Tortorella Rangers teams had issues. They only had eight or nine forwards the coach trusted. And the thing, and the reason I will pound the table for this, Rempe has been solid to actually good in his underlyings. The capability, uh, and that's with Gaudreau, you know, it's not like Gaudreau is doing all the work and he's just out there. Rempe and Gaudreau Vizi is doing a good job at five on five. We got to trick that. We got to, tr- I'm trying to think of the word, uh, tick. There we go. We got to tick those minutes up gradually. I understand not wanting to go right to 11, 12 minutes, but we can't be playing one forward six minutes a game and double shifting VZ. That's not fair to him. And ultimately it's hard to win that way. I need to see, and we're going to get a good look tonight because yeah. the devils are going to dress McDermott solely with the, the intent of getting their pound of flesh. We're going to see if Rempe actually fights, whether or not that actually happens, but we have to see something in the lines of, I need the coach. I need to know v- Laviolette trusts him. That's the yeah. biggest thing. If he goes up to 10, 11 minutes a game, he can be in the lineup. If he's 10, 11 minutes a game, he can be in the playoff lineup. If he's under 10 minutes, I don't think that's feasible. The thing about Matt Rempe, and we talked about it with Molly, who, you know, you will, we'll hear from her in a, in a couple of minutes here. We got a, uh, you know, uh, in a, in just a couple of minutes here, but Matt Rempe, in the few minutes that he's actually on there out on the ice, he is he's not just there. Like he is positively contributing to the team on both ends of the ice, whether it be offensively, where he literally parks himself in front of the goaltender, and this man being a giant that he is, this whoever goal whatever goaltender he's in front of cannot see within eight miles of of you know above or behind or left to right or of whatever of, of where he is because he's that big of a human being. He is he's attacking the net. He is doing positive things for this team offensively and defensively as well. When he's retrieving pucks, the other team and you'll notice when he's out there on the ice, not only are the fans cheering for him, but the other players for the other team are terrified of going anywhere near this guy. He's going into the boards. He's going into the corners, getting the dirty areas and players are afraid of battling with this guy. Like he is a positive addition to the team on both, on both aspects, you know, of the game. It's just a matter of, okay, well he's shown he can do it in seven minutes, spurts, eight minutes, spurts, 10 minutes, spurts. We need to now see him do it in double digit minutes for the rest of the season. If he can do that, like you said, he's, he's has to be playoff bound for sure. Bec- but, and the, the counterpoint is, uh, okay, well, if you don't trust him enough, well then one, why are you still playing him besides the fact that people like him? And two, who are you going to trust more over Rempe? And if you do trust somebody more than Rempe right now, then why aren't you playing them? Rempe's impacts are, are of all of the, you know, the face class or face puncher class that is in the league. He is not a net negative. Like pretty much all the rest of them are, you know, when you go and look at the Ryan Reeves of the world, the Matthew Oliver's of the world, Olivier's of the world, those types of players, you know, the Pat Maroon's now not Pat Maroon three years ago, the guys who are really only in the lineup for vibes and to fight, they are genuinely ineffective at hockey. Rempe, when he's played, looks like he has a clue. That is more than you can say for a lot of the guys the Rangers have auditioned on the fourth line over the years. And building off of this, this is something that the Rangers can be feel good about because A, he's cheap. B, he's a homegrown guy. C, they very, very much, and I we talk a lot about trying to sift through what matters, what's valuable, what isn't. You can't deny that the Rempe vibes matter for the guys in that room. And that's ultimately part of why he's going to, that's why he stayed up and not Edstrom. I would argue that he, and it's not like Edstrom was bad. It's just Rempe genuinely. I don't want to say the team looks at him like, you know, their child, but effectively they all look at him like their son, you know, and it sounds silly to say about another grown adult with a bunch of other grown adults, but they're giving him the hat for playing four minutes a game and touching the puck (laughs) three times. Like they are genuinely excited that this kid is here. He's having fun. Something that someone pointed out to me the other day 
Rempe, when he got called up, had 5,500 followers on Instagram. He's up to 60,000 followers in a month. He is very clearly enjoying this. And tonight against the Devils, we're going to see and we're going to get a really good idea if he's a guy or not, because the best thing he could do is just dare McDermott to punch him and to draw a penalty. Dare the other guy to fight him and don't engage with him. You are not not on that guy's level, Matt. You are a better hockey player than him. He is trying to fight you because he needs to feel important. You are good at hockey. Don't let a schmuck who only is valuable punching people determine your worth. You know, we talked about this two weeks ago. If they keep winning and the vibes are good, he deserves to stay. He does. He genuinely deserves to stay in the lineup. And also, you know, just because people challenge you to fights doesn't mean you have to accept them. Like, a lot of the people that are challenging him to fights are challenging him to fights because they can't play hockey. Matt Rempe has shown that he can't play hockey. Yeah, I mean, shelter minutes, you can argue argue about that, whatever. But it's not like he has no skill because clearly he has some skill with the puck. He's not the fastest skater in the world because he's 11 feet tall. But, like, he's not the slowest skater either. And he's somebody that has puck. He has hockey IQ. He understands, you know, to a certain extent where to be with the puck and, 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 you know, and where to go if he doesn't have it, et cetera, et cetera. Taking yourself off the ice for at least five minutes, because there's some guy that should be in the minors challenging you to fights is silly. I understand it's Rangers devils. I get people want to see the fights. I like, I get it. I it's rivalry. I get it. But at Devils the same, are a dead body. Poke them with the stick and yes. beat the shit out of them tonight. Yeah, I mean, dude, like this, the Devils don't deserve your time right now. The they Devils don't. are dead. The Devils sold. The de- they punted the season away. The Devils are dead. There's no, like, you fighting them only makes them feel better about themselves. It doesn't help you. You're one of the best teams in the league en route to hopefully, you know, potentially and hopefully win a Stanley Cup. These guys just sold at the deadline. They're going nowhere. You fighting their worst player is achieving nothing. Have have get McDermott to to get himself an instigator penalty, go on the power play and score. That's it. That's that like that's what Re- Matt Rampe needs to do tonight against the Devils and against the Islanders and the pay, like the Rangers play five games in seven days. Like this schedule like, this, makers, this, were this not is kind. crazy. Like this is this is a nuts. And week they don't even them. get twenty four hours between no. the Saturday and Sunday game because it's a mat- it's three o'clock Saturday and then matinee Sunday. I mean, right. I understand you want to get the Rangers on national television on Saturday ABC. That's a good thing, but you couldn't have threw them a solid on St. Patrick's Day. I understand they don't want the entire tri state area showing up to Madison Square Garden at seven p.m. on St. Patrick's Day with the blood alcohol of point oh nine, but <laughs> You got to throw them a bone somewhere in the schedule. They played two games in a week and then they've got five in eight days, which is just it just seems a little unfair. Uh, Quick's going to go tonight, which I find a little bit interesting, but that's probably being that they're going to have a heavy workload this week. They're going to have to lean on him a little more. Um, Last thing before we get out of here, because we do have another 30 minutes of this episode if you're watching this not live. So the last thing I want to touch on, and we did touch on this with Molly, um, I really am really excited that we're going to get two weeks of K. Andre Miller playing with somebody yes. that's not Truba. Yes. Because this is what we've been clamoring for. Mm-hmm. Because worst case, if this doesn't work, you can go back to what you already yeah. had. You can tinker around. You know, it was good to see they did this two weeks ago. They ultimately blew the lead and had to come back and win in overtime. But it, tinker, you know, you've got a little bit of breathing room. I like what I saw from Miller and uh, Schneider on Friday. I think. They complement each other reasonably well. I think Schneider has taken some steps this year. I won't say he's exactly where I'd like him to be, especially as far as his puck skills, but his impacts are a lot better. He's playing with a competent defensive partner in Gustafson, which has helped for all of their warts. But And I want to do a statistical dive on Schneider as well, but as far as drawing in, I, we also don't know if Fox is going to play tonight. He's a game time decision. Rue Weedle might draw in, which might reconfigure everything. Sure. But in a vacuum, two at least two weeks, if not more, we still don't know exactly what Truba has. They just said lower body, multiple weeks, which could be anything ranging from, you know, like a broken toe to like his leg has been amputated. So we'll find out. But. We're going to get a look at what Miller looks like with a partner who complements his skill set a little more. And I'm very excited to see what that looks like. 
I agree. I thought they had a great game against the Blues, although the Blues looked like they didn't want to be there and kind of just... Except for Booch. Booch was the only yeah, guy moving well, his ass Well, of there. course. I mean, coming back to Madison Square Garden, Pavel Buchnevich is always going to do that. Uh, I wish he would do it in a Rangers jersey, but that's just... That, that, that will be the hill that I personally die on. But the Blues didn't want to be there. They... they especially after the third goal the Rangers scored, they really looked like they didn't want to be there. They wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. So it's it's tough to... Yeah, the Rangers played a fantastic game, but some of it, for sure, is the Blues wanted to go out to dinner afterwards. Like, they, they really didn't want to... They didn't give 100%, let's say, uh, in that game. So, I, you know, both, both of those things are true. So it's... They had a good game, but it's tough to glean, you know, how good they could possibly be. I'm excited to see how they play tonight and this week. Five games in seven days or eight days or whatever it is, is going to be really tough. It's going to be difficult. I want to see how these new pairings play under duress of the schedule. It would be it will be interesting to see how they how they fight back against it. Truba is not coming back for a, for a couple more weeks. Yeah, Ruido is going to draw in potentially tonight for Fox. We'll see. I would like to see Ruido get in a couple of games this week anyway. Just to be, I mean, again, five games in seven days. Might as well play him just to see like how he fits, how he plays with the team, get him acclimated, et cetera, et cetera. You might as well do it now than game. I don't know. Game six of the playoffs, like when when you might need him, like you'd rather just do it now. So. I'm interested to see how they how they play and if this kind of play one is sustainable and two if it is sustainable will Laviolette keep the pairings when Truba comes back because that's a that's if he does it that's that might be a whole other topic of conversation. Um, they play the Devils tonight, Carolina tomorrow, which that's a brutal back to back. The Devils yeah. look dead, but the Devils always get up for the Rangers, even when they're bad. You know, we talked about that with the Islanders, yep. who they also play this week. Tampa Bay on Thursday. Tampa Bay's kind of had a rough go of it of his late. Islanders have won what six in a row now? Like six or seven in a row. The Islanders are kind of putting it together. They're taking right. advantage of the vacuum that's kind of formed in the Metro, especially where the Flyers, you know, they're a nice story, but I don't know if anybody really expected them to sustain. And that's not a knock on the Flyers. Flyers. It's just, it's hard to play the way they've played for 82 games and a fall off was probably somewhat to be expected, but put a nail in the coffin of the Penguins. I know the Flames yeah. did it la last week, but yeah. Saturday is a real opportunity to, to do the parties over grandpa to Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. Put them in a body bag, yep. national television. You know, every single commercial break, Sean McDonough is going to bring up Tristan, not Tristan Yari, Louis Deming. They're going to bring up the spicy pork. Put a body, a, put a nail in the Penguins coffin, never to be heard from again. And then Sunday, you're going to play on less than 24 hours rest against a division rival that's surging that you really could see in the first round of the playoffs if things shake out a certain way. The Islanders will be up for that game. Yeah. I hope the Rangers are up for before five minutes to go in the game. <laughs> That's not to say the Rangers can't come from behind, but it's a lot harder. It would be nicer if they didn't have to do that is yeah, what is, exactly. is the moral of the story. The, the Islanders are playing really well. I've, I've watched quite a bit of them over the last two weeks. I went to the game against the Bruins. I watched the Sharks game. I watched the Blues game. They are a lot smoother in transition. The defense has been quite a bit better. Uh, unironically, since Scott Mayfield got hurt, their defense has been a lot better, which not a knock on the guy, but the team does look a lot better without him in the lineup. Something Ranger fans are probably going to be saying in two weeks when we see Truba come back in and the defense takes a noticeable dip but i digress we're gonna learn a lot you know the rangers tweeted the schedule this morning and i said it's gonna put some hair on your chest it is this is going to be a stressful week five games in eight days is a lot it is it's it's gonna be really it, that's a lot of hockey that's a lot of hockey, but again, this is this is the time for Ru Ruido to come in, maybe get edged from back for a game or two if like somebody's you know sore or whatever. These games matter a lot for the Rangers, sure. Uh, they matter more for like teams like the Islanders and you know Hurricanes and stuff like that. But th this is now your time to prepare, get the get the good habits going, and you know, right off into right off in the playoffs. Like go go on a go on a high note. Go, you know, all all systems go with, you know, your 
your pa- your passes are crisp, your your strides are crisp, everything is you know on on a hundred percent because the, the it's if if you come in broken and battered and everything is disjointed and you're heading into game one of the playoffs like that's tough that's tough to come back from so hopefully good habits keep it rolling. Make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts or over on YouTube. Leave a five-star review if you could be so kind on the podcast platforms. Drop the video a like on YouTube if you're watching there. Uh, We'll probably drop something at some point before next Monday, but if not, we'll see you guys then. Later. All right, here we go. We have Molly Walker now joining us of the New York Post. I mean, she's the best. She's the best beat reporter covering the New York Rangers. I don't say that because she's here. I say that because I mean it. Molly Walker of the New York Post is here today. Welcome, Molly. Also, more importantly, happy belated birthday. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely introduction. I'll take it. That's for sure. And I'll be rubbing it in Colin and Vince's faces when I see them, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, well, I want to leave this off before we get to Rangers here, because this yeah. has been the discourse on social media <laughs> since the trade deadline here. I say this very tongue in cheek for, for those that are just <laughs> listening instead of watching the eye roll that I'm about to do. Vegas, huh? Such cheaters. They are the, <laughs> the LTIR cheaters of the universe. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what are we going to say? What is there to say? It's the rules. It's, this is the way that the NHL is designed. I take it up. Take it up with Gary Bettman. I don't know. I don't know what else is, there is to say. But I mean, for me, I'm a little biased because it's entertaining. You know, I, I imagine that the Vegas writers are having a field day with it. And as I would, too, if, if it was happening in New York. So it's it's content. It's it's fun. And, and it's the NHL, no matter how uh, weird or bizarre it is. <laughs> I feel like people should be more upset at their favorite team for not doing the same thing. Yeah. They should be at Vegas. Like <laughs> Vegas is just following the rules. Your team should just do it too. Like, I don't know what the, like, I don't know it why you're mad at Vegas. With Tampa and Kutra. Right. Like, yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, everybody's allowed to do it. It's just a matter of actually doing it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I would be curious to see, to, you know, ask around uh, upstairs in front offices, just their, their take on it. I guess if they, if they feel it, like it's almost, you know, morally you know wrong to do it frowned upon i don't know however you want to phrase it but i mean if it's within guidelines it's within guidelines what are you gonna do <laughs> so i wanted to start with the with the people that did not get to the rangers guys like jake gensel frank vetrano potentially pavel butchevich who knows with mm-hmm. the with all the rumors out there what have you heard and and learned from the deadline as to where these guys got with with jury were they even remotely close what were those conversations like I feel like, especially with Frank Vetrano, I think that there was genuine appeal there. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, the fact that the Rangers do know that that he can work alongside Chris Kreider and Mika Zibanejad, which was obviously a hole that that needed to be filled and, and was uh, at the top of jury's wish list for this trade deadline. Um, so I definitely think that there was something to that. But my understanding is that not only was Anaheim asking for a lot, but apparently Frank likes it in uh, in SoCal, which how could you blame him? Um, and there wasn't really any sense of urgency to move him or, you know, he he's comfortable and content with where he is and, and, and what's going on there. So um, I, I just don't think that came to fruition because of the price tag that uh, was coming over there from the Ducks. And I feel like that was kind of a, uh, a theme of the whole trade deadline. Uh, I mean, even Barry Trotz went on the radio and and he's like, you know, I haven't been in this role for a long time, but prices are ridiculous. <laughs> so I feel like that was uh, definitely true. And um, I think that jury showed a lot of restraint, um, not going all in on on some of those guys and still and yet still being able to address the needs that he needed to address, if that makes sense. I, I don't think that giving Brendan Offman or Gabe Perot to anybody <laughs> would have been uh, the right move to make, honestly. I really don't. I, I just think that those two, you know, you still have to protect the farm. You still have to protect the future. And those two guys in particular are understandably untouchables. And anything that, you know, any other general manager brought to jury, you know, he was not balking at that. What is your understanding now? You've been here a couple of years on the beat, got a reasonable feel for the Rangers as an organization, how they like to operate. What's your understanding of how this process kind of plays out for them now? Because you've been here a few years. 
Well, I mean, I think that anybody that knows the Rangers or, you know, follows the Rangers as a fan media, whatever it may be, you know, Chris Jerry is, is very, you know, close to the vest. Um, his inner circle is, is him, <laughs> um, is, is how it's been phrased to me before. So I think that that's just the way that he likes to do business. That's the way that he likes to move. I feel like every general manager has their own quirks, has their own way of handling business. And that's just juries, you know, that's just the way that, that he is. And, uh, it's how MSG, I feel like in general operates. So I think that's just, uh, probably the most that I could say about that. <laughs> The Rangers have been looking for a top line right winger all season. They've tried VC. They've tried Blake Wheeler. They've tried me. They've tried Nick. They've tried you. <laughs> they've tried everybody. Ultimately, I wouldn't say they got a a, a, a top of the line first line right winger. Right. The again the rumors with Butchnevich or Gensel right. or whoever it el whoever else it was. They didn't get that kind of player, but they got a few. Uh, they got a few really good complementary players that are ultimately going to make this team better. Do you think the Rangers? Did the best they could under the circumstance? Was there something that they left on the table that maybe they should have went after? Because you don't get too many opportunities when you're a Stanley Cup team that is that's as good as this to go all in and to really push the, the chips in. You don't. You don't. This doesn't happen every year. Do you think they made the right decision with the moves that they made? You know, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this just from from all the different points that you hit on there. I guess the first one that I want to go to is, you know, you talk about leaving big names on the table or not, you know, making those big moves. But you look at last season, they got Vladimir Tarasenko and Patrick Kane. Didn't work out. They were still lost in the first round, you know, and that was a, a, a situation of it just felt like there were too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, too many options, too many of similar kinds of players almost. It wasn't so much about complementing what what what's already in place you know which obviously is still the goal but you do get a little bit blinded by Vladimir Tarasenko and Patrick Kane being available in general but that didn't work out so I don't think that that necessarily means that the Rangers didn't you know get better at the deadline because they didn't get Jake Gensel or, or Frank uh, Vitrano or Buchnevich or any of the the type top right wing options that were that were available um I look at Roslovic as a pretty complimentary addition. And I don't think that the Rangers, I don't think that anybody who's followed this team closely is looking at that addition as so important that it it's like the one thing that's going to unlock Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider. That's up to Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider. That is more, more important than how they were going to fill that, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I, I I just think that, that that means more, that carries more weight. That's something that's on them, not so much on on Drury. I do think that Roslovic was a, a good pickup. I mean, I mean, it, that first game against the Blues, it's really difficult to evaluate because the Blues were really bad that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just call it what it was. St. Louis did not have a good night. It happens to everybody just difficult to evaluate that game as good as it was because of not having so much fight on the other end of the ice. But I did like what I saw in that first game from Roslovic on the first line. I think he brings speed. I think he's, a, he's a pretty, you know, North kind of guy. Um, and I feel like you look at how well Frank Vitrano worked, you know, that was speed and shoot first mentality. So it's just a different variation. And I, I think that it could work. And over time, it, develop chemistry and all that jazz. Um, I think that Roslovic was a good pickup and I don't think that fans should be so wrapped up in not getting on who they didn't get um, because that's not what's going to unlock that first line. What's going to unlock that first line is number 93 and number 20. So that's, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> You're making us feel very smart because that's been our take for a few weeks yeah, now. That it's no. ultimately going to come. Molly reads our tweets like this. this <laughs> is confirmed, confirmed listener of the show. We, it's we, logic, we talk about it's this. It's logical lot. thinking, guys. There it, is it not really a ton is. of logical thinking that goes on. We are <laughs> one Stanley Cup in one Stanley Cup since America entered World War II. We It'll, all just that'll do that to you. That you know that'll do it to the fans. You can't blame them. They're antsy. I don't blame anybody. But if you think step back think about it a little bit logically that is what's more important 
20 and 93 are much more important than whoever is on that right in that right wing spot. And like you said, you know, it could be me. Like they have so many people there over the years. Um, but they're, you know, they also I feel like because Mika and Chris have have played some so many minutes together and over so many years, it's it must be difficult. Yeah. to come in and st- start trying to play off of that kind of chemistry. And I mean, something that I always find so fascinating with them is, is the way that they pass to each other off the boards, because that is something that's developed over just years and years and so many minutes, so many games of being together. And that I feel like is just a microcosm of what a challenge it must be to come in and just try to add to that in any way, play off of it, contribute to it. It's difficult no matter what. As far as the rest of the regular season going towards the playoffs, what are you most curious to find out about this specific iteration of the Rangers? That's a good question. I think that I think that this group you could say is battle tested now. They've they've been around the block a little bit. This core has, you know, they went all the way to the conference final, disappointing first round exit when they had arguably the most loaded lineup that they've had in years. Um And it was interesting how they came into both of the seasons after those playoff finishes. And I think that this time around, it, I mean, you could say every year feels different, but their, their mindset is different. The way that they talk about things. And I also think that Laviolette has had a big impact on that and a big impact on the mindset, the camaraderie, the culture, the whole thing. I really do think that Laviolette has has his fingerprints all over this team and the way that they've gone this season and the way that they're playing. Um, but I, I'm curious to see how they have learned from the past and how they go into this playoff run differently than they have before knowing what they know going through what they've gone through how are they going to apply it moving forward and I just feel like that's a a beautiful thing about sports in general but I do feel like you know I just I I think back in the days when all we used to talk about was how young they were and how inexperienced they were no playoff experience you can't say that anymore can't say that anymore so they have you know they have they've been battle tested they've been through it they you know they've had some scars and it's uh it's going to be interesting and telling to see uh how they move going forward you mentioned 93 and 20 and <laughs> i i talk wait i talk about this every show and i i really wish i wouldn't it's it's really <laughs> annoying I, I i just wish you i just wish you would score so i could stop talking about this because of benedict has gone 30 know. games 30 games without a five on five goal before christmas let's just yes. say it yes, yes. 30 games know. When you're a first line setter with that kind of responsibility, and I know because we, we had Sam Rosen on the show when you kind of talked about, you know, the defensive responsibilities and, and that and that, like I get all that. But if you're the first line setter, you go 30 games without a five on five goal. That's a problem. No matter who it is, no matter what the name on the back of your jersey is, that's not good. So regardless of who the Rangers got or wh- whoever they got as their, you know, the, the third guy on that line, as you said, it's up to Kreider and Zabinajad to to do it you know, to get themselves going. What are they going to do to get themselves going like this? I'm sure Zabinajad knows. Hmm. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not like, I'm sure he's well aware that he's not producing at five on five. So, okay, well he's aware, but now what, what, what's the next step? I think that, you know, and I've talked to Mika through these stretches that since I've been around and it's something he's dealt with his whole career. Um, I think that, you know, moseying on over to to 20 for a second same thing he was also very streaky streaky for a majority of of his career I feel like it's you know since the 52 goal season he's just been a consistent goal scorer you know like that's just who he's kind of become which has been incredible to watch but Mika has had these scoring droughts throughout his entire career these streaky stretches so it's not something that he hasn't worked through before in the past. And I do, I imagine that having gone through it as much as he has in his career, he has his little ways, his mentality things, things like that, that he's going through the motions right now and trying to break through on that. And I do think that to Sam Rosen's point, 
that he does pride himself on being a two hundred foot guy. And if you are like sitting up in the press box, and if you do decide to just watch Mika Zibanejad from start to finish, he is an integral part of this team on what they do on a daily basis. He still has a presence out there. It's just not translating to the stat sheet, which is an issue when you're the number one center. And that is a fact that is not lost on Mika Zibanejad. I am sure of it. Um, And I just feel like it's something that, you know, you're going through the motions and when you're getting closer to the playoffs, I can imagine that you have just a jolt of energy that goes through you. And I can imagine that he is just, you know, working until he breaks out of it. And that's all you can do. You know, these things happen. They, they do. And whether fans want to go up in arms, it's unacceptable. Blah, blah, blah. Sure, that could be true. But it also could be, could be true that a player has been historically streaky his whole career. And he's just got to work through it until he's back. And that that's the argument here, the elevator pitch for why right. you should be excited. You know, they've gotten this far. They have like right. the fourth or fifth best record in the entire league. And he's got one five on five goal in <laughs> two and a half months. That's <laughs> that's a real good indicator that the potential for something is here. In your opinion, how far away do you feel that they are from? I don't want to say they're optimized, but their best version of themselves. I mean, this is the core. Yeah, this has been the core. And the core has proven that it can go all the way to the conference final and go up to nothing on the Tampa Bay Lightning, you know? So I think that I've thought, and I've said this so many times, the foundation is there. And if we're talking about this season in particular, since I've been covering the league closely, I've never seen a season this wide open as, as it has been. It just feels like it is anybody's ball game it really it really does there are the favorites or whatever but I do feel like I mean because I mean even watching this Rangers team on a night-to-night basis are they the fourth best team in the league their stats say that they are their record says that they are but are they so it's kind of like it does feel like it's wide open and it really any everybody's got their faults everybody's got their thing but you get hot at the right time You find chemistry at the right time. And with goaltending, the way that the Rangers have it, quite literally anything is possible. So I don't know how much answering the question of how far away they, like how much I'm answering that, but I feel like the foundation is in place. You know, it's just a matter of putting all the puzzle pieces together and creating a product and a playoff product that is going to carry them through all the way to the Stanley Cup final. So I, 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 you know, they're right there. I, I think their chance is as good as any. Honestly, I really do because it does feel like that's where the season has gone. But this group has also showed that they can do it and they can turn it on. And when they turn it on, they're a really, really tough group to beat. They're, they're tough to play against in that regard. You mentioned Kreider and Zabinajed's their chemistry. They've been playing together for a long time. Uh, another couple of people that have played together for seemingly 100 years now is, is Truba and Miller. Now Truba, <laughs> Truba is out for a couple of weeks now, but that pair has not changed for... This is the third coach now. Mm-hmm. They have had some have had some moderate success, but there's been also a lot of struggles when they were under David Quinn. There were struggles under Gallant, and there have been struggles under Peter Laviolette now with those two as a pair. I understand comfortability. I understand all of that. But there is now tangible success with other pairings, with other combinations of players on the blue line, except for 79 and 8 as a pairing. When is, or maybe Laviolette, I mean, I'm sure Laviolette's aware of this as well, but... Is there more of hey, we want to keep seventy nine and eight together because they've been around for because they've been together for forever and they're comfortable? But at a certain point, if it's not working, is there a willingness to change it when Truba comes back? I do think that, and just thinking back to when Laviolette first came in, he right off the bat said he wasn't married to the way things were beforehand. He said he had no issue with shaking up the lines, shaking up deep pairs, regardless of, you know, continuity, how how many years they've been together and whatnot. He was very forthcoming about, you know, not being married to anything. That being said, I do just, this is 
I guess, I don't know if you could call it speculation, but this is just kind of how I've seen the whole situation. I do feel like that LaViolette has taken into consideration how much movement this lineup went through in the last two years. Yeah. <laughs> and I also think that the players, because I remember toward the end of, of Gallant's tenure, the players just started talking about how difficult it was with how much the lineup was changing and how how every day they were with somebody else. They they, they were starting to become much more uh, forthcoming about how much of a, a of a of an obstacle that was. So I do think that that has been in the back of Laviolette's mind this season. I think that their success and that just how well they've done this season, staying they've been the top of Metro since October 24th. I'm pretty sure it is off the top of my head. Um, has deterred Laviolette from changing things, and you know a lot of his lineup decisions have been because of injuries. I do feel like continuity has been valued by LaViolette uh, in that regard, but I really liked what I saw from Schneider and Miller <laughs> the other night. I, I will say that, that that looked really, that looked really good. That looked really promising. Uh, the way Schneider has just, you know, stepped up in those sorts of situations has been really um, enjoyable to watch from such a young guy. Um, so who knows? Who who knows what's going to happen when when Truba comes back? If this Miller Schneider pairing continues to ex- again, they looked really good against a really bad Blues team. <laughs> so it's it, the Devils, the Hurricanes. These are all coming up that are definitely going to happen before Truba comes back. So there's definitely a possibility that the lot that the Defensive pairs look a little bit different if Laviolette likes enough of what he's seen from from Miller and Schneider. But I do think that he's had to value continuity to take into consideration what this group was going through the last two years, which is, you know, that's such a fair way to approach it, especially when you're trying to, you know, appease the players and, you know, come in and, and start a good culture and stuff like that. Taking that stuff into consideration, I feel like must go a long way. You mentioned the idea that they are battle hardened. When we talked to Sam earlier in the season, he mentioned the idea that this group really likes each other, that they're mm-hmm. really committed to each other. How much do you feel that's kind of been part of the missing component of the last couple of seasons? That you need that level of uh, saying emotional connection to your teammates might be a little bit weird, but like you see how much the group loves Rempe. He's only mm-hmm. been here a month, <laughs> but they all treat him like a child. Their son. Yeah. They're chanting for him. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not even a team thing. The, the guard. So- Erupts every time he's on the ice. <laughs> no, it's so great. No, I definitely think it's important. Um, and I think that it's something that they've developed over the last few years. From what I've heard around the league and, you know, in researching him before he actually came in, like, this is what he does. Like, he brings teams together. Like, he's really good at creating a culture like that. I mean, they finish every practice with a hug at center ice. He likes to call it a huddle, but it's a hug, you know? So it's that those sort, sorts of things have an effect throughout the whole lineup, throughout the whole roster into the locker room. Um, so I really do think that La Violette was, was a really good addition to this group. We gotta touch on Rempe Mania because because yes. this guy he's he's twenty one he's I think at least eleven feet tall on, on ice skates. <laughs> this guy as he yeah he fought the first few times you know in the in his first few games, but just watching him play, he's looked like an effective bottom six player. It's not just because he tall or he fight like <laughs> this like this guy can actually play the game of hockey, which is very which is. I, I, like one of the things that we talked to, I, that I mentioned before the, the the deadline was in recent recent deadlines, Rangers maybe have had a thought about oh the Rangers need more sandpaper or grit or whatever or any of these things. But Remp because of Rempe's emergence from thin air essentially, mm-hmm. like the Rangers didn't have to go and get a sandpaper guy. They didn't have to go get one of those intangible. They didn't have to trade a fifth round pick to get John Scott. Like they have, they have that, but also Matt Rempe can actually play hockey. Like he's, he, it, it's, it's fun to watch him when he's out on the ice and he, as he's trying to 
get puck retrievals it's or fight uh, along the boards and you see how everybody on the other team is terrified of going anywhere near this man like this is this is good for the team and not only because yeah people like him and he's he's big and he fights but also he's actually a positive addition on the ice i just remember when he first came in and he just was like an anomaly like he's just He's six foot eight and a half. And he skated like he was six foot eight and a half. Like I remember watching him for the first time, you know, rookie camps and and all that stuff, prospect camps. And he looked so far away from cracking an NHL roster when he first came in. And the way that Larry described him, which I really liked, is like he was like a hulking like ball of clay that the Rangers just got and that they could mold and see what he could become because he can't teach height. He can't teach strength. And the guy's already got that. So, and I know he told me that Tanner Glass has always been in his corner, has always been a big advocate for him in the organization. Um, so I found that to be really interesting, but he's been putting in a lot of work. He, they, the Rangers have been putting a lot of work into him and this season in Hartford, suddenly I'm hearing all about Matt Rempe. Like suddenly I'm here. He had a great game. Oh, he fought this guy. He fought this guy, a game winning goal in this one. And I was just like, since when, you know, like it kind of, it came out of nowhere. But once you start, you know, making waves in the AHL, you get the parent club to pay attention. So I think that they, I, I mean, that all season has been bringing in want to uh, evaluate, but you know brought up why not he can then you know he's played a lot of sheltered bit at that but I, I feel like face it's just it's different and Larry also said this to me the Rangers must love the chaos of it too, because it just, it it's generating a lot for them, whatever it may be like guys are on the ice looking for him. The fans are fiending for him. Like it's just, there's so much going on and it's working. Like it's, it's having a positive effect. I like <sighs> It's 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 great. It really is. It's a great story. It's great for the Rangers. Um, it's great for Rempe. He's such a good kid. He's enjoying every minute of it. Like, it's honestly endearing how much he's loving it. Um, and it's fun. I'm very curious to see how things progress going into the playoffs because I do think that, that Laviolette plays him very sheltered minutes. And when you get to the playoffs, you want to be able to roll all four lines. You want to, but Laviolette is also a guy like Gerard Gallat was. They, you know, it's just the way the Rangers are built. They ride their top guys a lot. You know, those are the guys that, I mean, play Artemi Panera in 30 minutes a night if you could. You know, that's just the way coaches are going to want to handle this Rangers team. Um, so I'm just very curious to see and how, how it, how it, unfolds going forward every day they're working with Rempe extra on the ice even though he's not an extra he's putting in extra work every because they know that he needs to be refined a little bit more if he's going to be their fourth line wing in the playoffs so I, I'm just curious to see how it'll go but it has just been such an unbelievable story such such fun to cover just endless content and he's been just chef's kiss and all and everything the guy loves to talk is fun and it's just it's great as far as the lineup and configurations permutations is there yeah. anything they haven't tried yet this season mm. that you yourself are personally curious about that you would like to see um that's a good question um i think that depending on how roslovic pans out I mean, the one thing that I've always thought, even before the new guys came in, I thought I thought Jimmy VC should have gotten a little bit more of a look on that top line, just because. I mean, talk, you want to talk about another great story? I mean, Jimmy VC totally fits that bill as well. But Jimmy VC has the genetic makeup 
and skill set to complement that top line. He definitely does. And I think that he probably could have gotten a little bit more of a run in that spot. But I understand, you know, wanting to reward Kako and and wanting to try to jumpstart him a little bit, especially going to the deadline when, you know, maybe they could have waited to see if if Capo was able to secure that spot. Um, obviously didn't happen, but I think I do think that VC uh, is a good is a good option for that for that top right wing. But I, something tells me that Rosovic will stick. I, I mean, there's no reason why he shouldn't. Um, but that's definitely that's definitely one that I feel. But otherwise, I feel like I feel like we've seen most of the of the combinations that anybody uh, could be thinking of. Honestly, so do they have what it takes to go all the way? Yeah, do they have what it, in I, the concise I, manner. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I do think that they do. I really, I really, really do. I really, really do. When you have goaltending, the way that the Rangers have goaltending, when you have a second line like the Rangers do, the way that they've been operating all season long, when you have Artemi Panarin setting a career high in goals with Alexi Lafreniere on his other wing, yeah, they have what it takes. They 100% have what it takes. And I think that they've, you know, they've, I mean, sometimes when they play physical, which is how they're going to have to play in the playoffs, no doubt, it's just a matter of getting up for it every single night. But sometimes, I mean, it's, I'm I'm more so thinking about the last time they played the Devils. I mean, that that team could win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> you know, like they they have the foundation in place. They have the intangibles. They have the skill set. They have the talent. Why, why, why wouldn't they be able to? And especially in a, in a league this season where um, it does feel like it's been pretty wide open. Um, I just think that it's really, it's anybody's Stanley Cup this year. That's, that's, my, that's my hot take, I guess you could say. It really does feel like it's so wide open. And why, why wouldn't the Rangers be able to? If anything, I feel like they're probably one of the top favorites, people say. Um, I, I really do think th- I really do think that they have what it takes. I do, and that's just that's not you know just because I I cover them. I, honestly, I, you know I would say if they didn't, uh, but I, I I do. I think that ever that their track record, everything that they've shown, uh, shows that they can. Molly, you're the best. Really, really appreciate your time. Technology <laughs> issues. Listen, sorry for all the tech difficulties, everybody. You're not in control. Like, yeah. It'd be one thing if you were in control. They'd be like, oh, you know, what's yeah. what's what's, what's happening? Molly wants to get out. Like, what's what's going on? No, but we really <laughs> appreciate your time today, Molly. You're fantastic, Molly Walker, the New York Post. I mean, your coverage is all. Like, and, I, and again, I would say this: if you're here, whether you're not here, like I I, I say that I say because I mean it. You do fantastic work covering this team. Really appreciate your time, and thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me, guys. I'll see you.